Robots. Helpful or threatening? Cute or scary? Whether we like it or not, these machines are becoming more commonplace and fundamental to the way we live our lives. Let's chat. Whoops, can you say that again? In this series, the FT will take a closer look at the roles that robots may play in our homes, in the workplace and the world around us. We'll show how far this technology is advancing and what the coming robot revolution means for humanity. Recent advances in technology have allowed robots to increasingly look and act like humans. But how far do machines need to resemble people in order to coexist with us? Here's a test. Which of these robots makes you feel more uneasy? Hi, I'm Matt Kuroi. Nearly half a century ago, the term uncanny valley was coined to refer to the point where robots, due to their near but not quite human appearance, elicit anxiety rather than empathy from the people around them. After decades of success in churning out industrial robots that helped to make cars and TVs, researchers at Japanese universities and companies are once again trying to explore human-like robots, this time trying to overcome uncanny valley in the hope that they will be socially acceptable. Next to me is Matsuko Roid, a robot that looks like a person, which is modeled after a very popular Japanese celebrity called Matsuko Deluxe. He became the first android to host a Japanese TV program for six months. The late night evening show was widely popular, captivating Japanese viewers with the stunning human-like appearance of the android host. Takeshi Mita is the chief executive of A-Lab, the company that co-developed Matsuko Roid. He hopes that the novelty of utilizing an Android will be a selling point for customers. アンドロイドを最初にご覧になれた方は、やはりどうしてもあのびっくりしたりとか驚かれたりとかあの気持ち悪いとか怖いという方もいらっしゃるんですけども、不思議なことに時間が経過するとどんどんどんどんその人間の
However, in Japan, companies are betting that lifelike robots will be popular with consumers, especially as the country wrestles with a shrinking labor force and a rapidly aging population. Multiple studies have shown cultural differences in attitudes towards robots. Generally, people in Japan are considered more tolerant of human-like robots since they have been exposed to them in animation and exhibitions from a young age. In Japan, Toshiba's Chihira robot is already used at information desks of department stores in Tokyo, and the company hopes the robot can also be used to care for the elderly. According to the company, the trick to making the robot lifelike is an air pressure system that smooths out the robot's movements. Attention is paid to each detail, from the robot's skin to its fingers, so that the machine is as close to a human being as possible. ですから我々はタブレットが使えるあるいはスマートフォンが使える方が別にこのコミュニケーションアンドロイドで無理にコミュニケーションする必要はないとは思っているんですがそうではない方々がたくさんいらっしゃると思う年寄りの方お子様あ
Back at Stanford, researchers working in the emerging field of social robotics say that getting robots to fit into everyday life will require a set of qualities that are more than skin deep. They say robots need to develop a whole new social etiquette to live among people, even if they look nothing like them. The interactions can take unlikely forms, as I found out myself. So you want me to put that together, yeah. slot it in, I'm going to pick one of these up. I need, I need some tools. <laughs> I'm just going <laughs> to... Right, okay. <laughs> Let's take a seat over here at the sofa. All right. <laughs> she wants me to sit down. She wants us both to sit. It's not going to move. So, Wendy, what just happened in there? What happened right there was that we had a demonstration of a few of our interactive robots. Uh, we had the interactive drawers, um, the robot sofa. I think there's a uh, operating hypothesis that maybe the right way to engender social interactions is to build the humanoid robots. What our research shows is that people respond socially even when the robot is an ottoman. It only needs to show some sort of initiative or engagement to bring that out. This suggests there is no need to make robots look like humans. We already project our own human qualities onto them. The trick, say researchers, is to look beyond this to a new level of social interaction that will govern the future world where robots and people mix. I think it's possible that people anthropomorphize because there isn't a long history of things that interact with you that aren't people or other animals. But there's this other thing, which is that we're discovering there's a lot of important functional aspects to the things that we do in the social every day. When we engage in interaction, there's a lot of pre-queuing that shows that you're available for interaction and that you're willing to interact. The hope is that once they pick up on human cues, these robots can serve us without us even noticing and disappear into the background. What do you think? This is a long way from the vision of populating the world with a new breed of artificial humans. Despite progress in robotic technology, there is still some way to go before scientists and companies can overcome the uncanny valley dilemma so that people are comfortable living alongside androids. Perhaps for a time being, Pepper the Robot can help to bridge the gap in attitudes toward humanoid robots across the world. Here in this room, Pepper is a store assistant. It's intentionally designed to look and act cute, but it looks enough like a robot not to scare people in homes and offices. While experts continue to debate the use and purpose of humanoids and androids, the crowds flocking to see Pepper, a SoftBank store, suggests that our fascination with human-like robots shows no sign of abating. <laughs> <laughs>